in order to go beyond where you have been, you have to be willing to do things differently. And sometimes doing things differently means forgetting about the old rules and just thinking about the fundamentals. So welcome to Breaking the Rules 2.0. So we have a new setup here. We're using the Fast Matte Titanium White, Regular Titanium White, Windsor Yellow, Cadmium Yellow, Yellow Ochre, Cadmium Orange, Cadmium Red, Venetian Red, Perylene Red, Alizarin Permanent, Burnt Umber, Sap Green, Ultramarine Blue, Indigo, and Ivory Black. Mineral Spirits and Walnut Alkit Medium. As the title of this video suggests, we are going to do things a little differently today. So for the placement, I'm literally going to draw for about a couple seconds. You're going to have the photo reference on the top left corner so you can refer to it as I am painting. Now, with the change of setup, I'm going to be talking to you in voiceover style. So narrating this to you after the fact. Now you notice that there's a few extra colors on the palette. And if you missed any of the colors that I mentioned, don't worry, just go down to the description box down below and you'll see what those colors are. So the first thing I'm going to do is mix the color value web. Now this video is about breaking the rules 2.0. So this is a second version of a video that I've made in the past where the emphasis was on less on technique and more in the art of painting, painting as an art form on its own. So as you're seeing, I'm mixing up the color value web kind of just mixing a whole bunch of different colors. You're seeing how in the middle there's a bunch of red. Uh, I just used the cadmium red there. Um, the medium I'm using quite freely. Now what I'm trying to do is just have a value range established on the palette and pay very close attention to the color combinations that I'm using to obtain a particular effect with the color because with this style of video I will not be able to show you all of the paint mixtures in the painting at the same time or during the painting at the same time so you're going to have to memorize uh, so to speak the colors I will explain them to you as I um, as the footage progresses but in the lighter values I'm have a little more of the yellow now let's proceed to an educated mess so what does an educated mess mean now this type of video is a little difficult to explain because this is about not so much a how-to or a tutorial step-by-step -step kind of approach even though I'm giving you steps. What I'm trying to do is react. The initial charcoal lines, those few lines that I put in that are pretty difficult to see was just to place something on the surface. So I just wanted to make sure that the head was a little bit higher up. And oh, by the way, the photo reference was obtained through a copyright free website, a different one than the one we were using before. Uh, this one is known as um, Upsplash. It's a copyright free um, resource where you can get images, uh, not just portrait images, but other images that you can use for uh, commercial purposes and you know without any of the copyright problems. So from this point it looks almost like a mushroom of some sort um, but what you're actually seeing is I'm using value and color to construct the front of the forehead. Now this is nothing new. You've seen me work in this style before but it's been a long time since I've shown you this type of uh, way of painting. I believe this to be a very freeing way of working. I'm just working with color and just laying down the foundation for where the mask of the face is going to fit. I'm painting very very thick and remember those color combinations in the beginning. So for the lighter middle tones it's pretty much a combination of the cadmium red, yellow ochre, titanium white. There is a little bit of influence from the uh, Venetian red. I've been using Venetian red a lot in my studio paintings. Now what I want to introduce to you in this episode 
is going to be something that's very difficult to uh, put into words. Uh, but I'm painting freely. I'm painting very freely. See how I'm kind of reacting? I put in one brush stroke, I put in another brush stroke next to the brush stroke and relate all of these brush strokes together. To me, the photo reference is nothing more than a suggestion, and I am not concerned with likeness at this point. I am not concerned with how this painting looks at this stage. I'm not concerned with am I following the steps properly. I'm not concerned with any of that. As you're seeing, the paint is moving so effortlessly excuse me, effortlessly across the surface of the panel. And so right now I'm relying heavily on instinct. But I will talk about the, you know, the process in, in some kind of detail, right? The panel itself, as I mentioned before, was a previous oil painting. But what I did one day is I took a bunch of colors that were on my palette, combined them with a palette knife and covered over that surface. That's one way that I reuse painting. Sometimes I'll just paint right over them without taking that extra step. But having oil paint already dried on the surface that you're working on does help the paint to stick a little bit better. Now let's see, which rules have we broken at this point? Well, in my videos, I usually don't say that I'll ever tell you with any kind of absolutism, you must do this, you must do this, therefore that, and then henceforth so-and-so will occur. I usually never say that in my videos, but we have omitted the umber sketch. We have omitted any kind of preliminary drawing. We have omitted even the very act of starting with, um, you know, thicker paint. I actually went in with the uh, walnut medium in the middle, so at this point, I've broken pretty much all the rules except for one, which is big shape. And I'm not actively telling myself at this point when I'm painting to keep shapes simple, to stand back, to squint, all these things that I always tell you in the um, episodes. I'm reacting to the painting at at this point. And I can only really do this um, when I'm not painting and talking at the same time. So remember, this is voiceover style, so this is narration after the fact. Now you're seeing how I'm going right in with eyebrows. I usually don't do that. I usually don't go right in with dark accents, but on this day, I was reacting to the paint. And this is actually, if you follow me on Instagram, this is actually how I produce or have been producing a lot of my more recent um, figure paintings and such that I've been posting on Instagram. And before the video goes on too much longer, I want to also say that there's going to be a, a bonus video for my patrons uh, as to say an extra thank you to my patrons on Patreon. So each week now I'm going to be uh, hopefully if my computer doesn't fail me. Each week I'm going to be uploading a second video specifically to my patrons on Patreon. It's going to be a short video, a behind the scenes. So right after I'm done filming, uh, right after I finished filming this episode, I filmed a kind of a, a short improv, um, you know, kind of uh, after the fact, uh, behind the scenes video talking about the process that I used for this painting. For those of you on Patreon, just go on to the Patreon. Uh, by the time that this video was uploaded to YouTube, the second video should have been uploaded to Patreon. Remember, just click it so the link will work. Thanks again to all of you on my Patreon. You are literally saving me during these times. Now back to what's going on with the painting. So I have now covered all the way down towards the mouth. And again, I broke another rule. What do I usually say in the beginning? Focus on the main triangle. I always say, focus on the main triangle, which is the two eyes and the nose, because everything else is so much easier to move relative to the eyes, 
the eyes are the most difficult thing to move in general. The nose is the second most difficult, and then so on and so forth. That's what I usually tell you, right? At this stage, I don't care. At this stage in the painting, I'm reacting to the paint. I'm reacting, and this is a very active process. I would say this is an intermediate to advanced uh, way of thinking in painting, but to those of you that are beginners, I actually highly recommend that you do this uh, to experiment with your own mindset when you're painting. It's a very difficult thing to put into words, uh, but it's kind of a carefree, letting go kind of scenario because this, this looks hopeless to, to the blind eye. The way that the painting is at this stage is hopeless, but to me, I'm starting off with something that is workable, meaning that it's simple, it's super simple, it's workable. It's something that feels solid. There are planes. There's a light plane on the nose. There's a light plane on the forehead. There's some color for where the mouth is suggested. There's even some color. It almost looks like a ghost-like figure underneath of the, the chin. And it's a solid foundation. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the concept of working with shape. As you saw, I put an even darker accent there for the um, for the eyes. The eyes are looking down. There's a bit of uh, makeup that the model's wearing. Usually I'll omit the makeup, but I won't omit the makeup as much with this painting. Now you're seeing I'm going right into the dark of the hair again. Something you never see me do in my paintings. And this is how you can paint very freely, just mm -hmm. reacting to the paint. And I'm using a light brush, a middle tone brush, and a dark brush. So I'm not really breaking a rule there. It's just an instinct. It's, it's a habit, really, to um, have my brushes organized. But again, Keep in mind that I'm working from the inside out with this painting. I'm sorry that the brush strokes kind of went off screen a little bit, but you know, I'm doing what I can do. Now, what does it mean to work from the inside out? Now, if you're noticing, I'm going to start to slow down my rate of narration just so that the video doesn't have too much talking at the same speed, if you know what I mean. Now, working from the inside out literally means working with large planes of color. That's why I, I titled this little segment of the video, An Educated Mess, because I'm just going in with mass, putting in what I'm seeing. I'm working purely perceptual uh, with the paint, though I am thinking of planes, but this is mostly perceptual, and I'm just sculpting with the planes. When I was painting, I didn't really say that to myself. It's just more of a reaction. So now I'm going to, again, slow down the narration a little bit so that the video isn't filled with too much talking at the same speed. And remember, at this stage, you already have, we already have a sense of three-dimensionality, but that is only because of the values. Remember that. The values is what helps to create the sense of something three-dimensional. Now, to justify the looseness of this start, or at least to try to justify it, in my mind, I was thinking if I could get something to be 
solid, something that feels solid, it should be no more than a few brush strokes at the most to move anything. Contrary to what I usually say, I should be able to move the simplification of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, everything could be moved. The hard part is getting the sense of something solid. Surprise color. I'm going to put in magenta. This is Winsor and Newton magenta. So the model does have purple hair, which is pretty awesome. What am I going to do? The photo reference is only a suggestion to me. And in fact, I can't really see portions of the right side of the photograph. Even in the original picture, I couldn't see it. And of course, the hair wasn't as bright purple as I'm going to paint it. Remember, the photo reference is merely a suggestion. We're creating a painting, not a photograph. So, that being said, I'm just letting the brush roam free. Usually, I won't go right into the hair this early in my demonstrations or in my paintings. But remember, forget about the rules. The only thing that really matters is the fundamentals. The fundamentals being light and dark, half tones, which are your values within structure and color. You have a lot more freedom with color than any of the other fundamental things that I mentioned. That's why we're kind of going a little wild with the color of the hair, throwing in the magenta, which by the way, it was just magenta and um, titanium white and a little bit of, you're, you're going to see a little bit of the indigo influence in the colors. And again, see how we're building from the inside. This is tremendous amount of fun working this way. And it's a mindset. It's a change in the, your way of thinking, or at least for me, it was a change in the way that I was thinking. Usually, I'm much more careful. I'm much more meticulous when I'm painting. But recently, I've been trying to let go. Let go. Know the fundamentals. Use the fundamentals. Keep them in the back of my mind. And just react with paint. Now, if you will allow me to say something that uh, doesn't necessarily relate to the painting, but relates to uh, the very art of learning, in my opinion. In my opinion, if we continue to do things the exact same way and follow a sort of a recipe, so to speak, we will always obtain similar results. And if we want to get somewhere in our ability in painting, if we want to improve, if we want to get somewhere new, that means we have to change something that we are currently doing. And that change can be a very uncomfortable at times, but it is through the experimentation that you will achieve something new. You're kind of like an explorer in a sense. And so in order to go beyond where you have been, you have to be willing to do something that you have never done before. Do something that makes you uncomfortable. Now for me, I'm not going to lie, this is not that uncomfortable in, in painting. But at first, this was very uncomfortable for me, especially in the beginning. Remember we started with that mushroom looking thing? In the beginning, that was very uncomfortable for me. And there's still one thing that's very uncomfortable for me in this type of style of painting. And I'm very uncomfortable with the letting go factor in painting. But I find that the more I let go, so to speak, 
the more I let go, free myself of the rigidness of trying to follow uh, every kind of step, the more I let go, the more fun painting is for me. And in my opinion, I think the results are much stronger and much more free. Now, enough of that stuff. I know you want to hear about the actual technique involved in the painting at this stage. So let me break it down for you. We have just a few simple values for each section of the painting. You can think of the painting as the face, the large planes of the face, the smaller planes for the features, that is the eyes, uh, nose, mouth, mandible, forehead, right? Even though the last two I wouldn't consider features. But anyway, all of the little areas. See, I'm starting to add in another value for the eyes. What is getting me through all this is in the back of my mind, I'm relating shapes. So allow me to elaborate on what is actually going on in the painting. As I put in that brush stroke on the top of the upper eyelid, you see how I'm putting an intermediate value between the uh, dark to the left, uh, the darkest corner to the left, and then um, the highlit region of the eye. One thing you don't really see in the footage is the fact that I'm very far away from the painting. If you recall, uh, the palette is set up on a piece of wood, so it's kind of a makeshift table. Uh, it's providing a barrier to keep me at least an arm's length away from the painting. I actually admittingly like to be a little closer to the painting, but when you're further away from the painting, it gives you more perspective. So right now, again, I'm trying to, it's kind of hard to do this. So back to the painting, what's actually going on with the painting. I'm putting in more information for the eyes with smaller brushes. And it is in relating these shapes that I'm able to figure out, well, this value Okay, so the one above the eyebrow, that value needed to get a little bit lighter relative to the value surrounding. The edge had to get a little bit sharper, and the eyebrow itself had to move down a little bit. Remember in the beginning I said it, it's not that difficult. If you're painting in this way, it's not that difficult to move shapes around. That's the, the very free and fun part about all of this. But in any case, what's happening is as I'm starting to subdivide the shapes on the features, I'm not going to get them 100% right. So I hope you're following along with me. This is a very important thing. As I put in information, I'm not going to get it right at first but I'm going to put the information there with pretty much my best guess. And I'm still working based off of instinct, even in these more careful areas. I'm not measuring. I'm not even using my brush to do comparative measurement. There, there's no caliper out there. None of that. The lips aren't completely in the right place relative to the nose, nor are the eyes in the relative correct place to the eyebrows. I don't care. And it's so hard for me to say that to you. I don't want to sound um, arrogant or anything like that, but at this stage and throughout the entire painting, I didn't care. I was reacting. To the paint. That's why this video is Breaking the Rules 2.0, because in Breaking the Rules 1.0, uh, I had less experience with this whole video stuff. So I was a little more timid back then. I was a little more timid. But now I'm telling you, I don't care. At this point, I'm reacting to shape. See how I'm relating the bottom of the nose to the top of the upper lip? I'm reacting 
and placing brush strokes down, standing back and comparing shapes to one another. It's a very fun and uh, it's, a, it's a process of exploration. And now, once again, I'm going to let the footage roll. I'm going to slow down my rate of narration so I don't fill up the video with too much talking. Though now I'm actually doing something very important. I'm putting in a darker accent for the bottom of the nose and the side of the nose. That accent is going to help me move the nose down. It had to move down a little bit at this point. Now, ultimately, what I want you to get out of this episode is something that is actually occurring right now. What is happening is that I'm finding form with freedom. And I'm going to quote that one to Studio and Kaminati, and in uh, particular Nelson Shanks, who would say that. At least I heard from other artists that he would say that. Find form with freedom. I had no idea what that meant for the longest time. Now I'm beginning to understand it. And hopefully I can convey it to you. Because this is the pivotal point now in the episode. Find form with freedom. Ultimately, what a lot of us want is to create a painting that looks like something right and it's safer to go at that with the classical approach with a classical type of approach it's just safer that way to have your lines set in stone that's why coloring books are so successful and you know things like that but ultimately this is now starting to catch up with a painting that would have had a more careful beginning. Pay very close attention to what I'm saying. We work from the inside out with color and tone to create something that would have taken 10 times as long had it been carefully planned out in the classical approach. It's a very important thing to note because now we're going to be able to create more depth in the painting. And what we're doing there is putting the bottom of the shoulder. You can't really see it too well in the, uh, the photo reference. In fact, I, I'm not going to show too much of the bottom of the photo reference. I'll write down in the description where you can um, look up this photo reference. Uh, but the model's shirt is a little too far down, I think, for YouTube's guidelines. So um, YouTube will kind of yell at you if you show, if you even show a clavicle. So yeah, I'm just going to leave it cropped at that. But just explaining the thing to the left is the shoulder. And it's very impressive to be able to do this to be able to see what was once a kind of ambiguous blob of color an educated mess turn into something like this that we can start to steer into a more uh, three-dimensional sense of form now if you'll allow me to talk about color a little bit since um, you know you can't really see the color mixtures on the on the footage as well 
that highlight right there is pretty much just cadmium orange with um, a little bit of titanium white. I also should explain to you why I have the fast matte white, fast matte titanium white, and regular titanium white. I'm using the fast matte in the areas that I'm painting more thick, and that is because the fast matte is a fast drying color. In fact, my medium, the walnut alkyd medium is a fast drying color. I'm not using that medium for any specific reason. It's just that I, I ran out of liquid and I ran out of neomagilp and I haven't obviously haven't gone to any stores. So I'm just using what I have. The walnut alkyd works just fine. If you have neomagilp, that works possibly even better. Liquin probably works about the same. Um, as the walnut alkyd. But in any case, the uh, the colors. I'm now starting to put in the indigo blue. I should also explain what indigo is doing in there. It's a Winsor and Newton color. The indigo, for me, is a... Um, it's kind of a deeper blue when combined with a little bit of white than ultramarine blue. But when you're using less of the white, I have... the feeling that the indigo blue behaves closer to the ivory black. But what I like about the indigo blue is that with the tiniest bit of titanium white, it activates the color and makes it almost a deep, almost like a thalo blue without having thalo blue, if you know what I mean. Thalo blue is an extremely uh, saturated blue. It's not a bad color. It's just it's not on my palette currently. And now the indigo with a tiny bit of the um, titanium white that activates the blue, makes it much brighter, and then combine that with magenta. And now you're really talking color. That purple in the hair is, I think, one of my favorite parts of the painting. Just being able to throw purple into hair is a lot of fun. And that was a little bit of the uh, burnt umber, cadmium orange, and um, a little bit of the magenta for the cast shadow on the shoulder. At this point, I had the shoulder a little bit too short, but I eventually noticed that a little bit later. Now just letting the brush strokes roam free. Completely contrary to how I usually work and how I, should I say, how I usually uh, film these YouTube episodes. You could have also ob obtained this result or something similar to this had you used um, a Lizarin permanent the tiniest bit of the white, and then ultramarine blue together. It could have also created a purple. Or you could have easily just combined the alizarin permanent, the ultramarine blue in about equal parts, and then added a tiny bit of titanium white. That would have also obtained a very nice uh, purple. As you're seeing the brush strokes move so freely, so freely, Now remember, this video, as was the original Breaking the Rules video, is about breaking the rules of technique, but not about forgetting the fundamentals. The fundamentals are the backbone of which all of this relies on. Now another word of advice that I would like to give uh, to those of you that want to obtain this level of freedom in painting, it helps to have a ton of experience, a ton of studio hours spent. To steer specific now means that what we're going to do 
is put in even smaller shapes into the larger shapes. As you're seeing now is where that kind of magical, oh my goodness, it starts to look like a realistic thing now, really starts to happen. And that's when you put in smaller brush strokes. See how that little tiny brush stroke for the eye? Remember the white of the eye is uh, half tone, usually just black and white and some flesh tone, and you have that half tone. Now what I was saying before is having tons of experience painting helps to make the transition easier. If you have less experience, this is not an impossible thing to do. What I highly suggest is a lot of shorter poses. If you want to do gesture drawing using um, online resources, since most of the um, most of the art centers are closed at the moment. But if you're just beginning, do a lot of short poses with pencil, charcoal. You will start to feel that sense of freedom. And then slowly start to work longer and longer till you start to obtain a sense of freedom in your more uh, developed paintings, such as what we're starting to do here. Now, again, remember, we put in the light for the eye, and then we put in a more highlit region for the upper eyelid to the left. Now we put in a more highlit region for the upper eyelid to the right, constantly moving from the left to the right, following the bilateral symmetry that we have, trying to make sure that each area is um, you know, relating to one another. I'm telling you this now, but remember when I was painting, I didn't think too much about it. I just reacted, which is why the eye to the left is a little, it's a little different than the eye to the right. Usually, I probably would have, I probably would have tried to match the eye to the right to the eye to the left. I would have just imposed that into the painting. But at this stage and throughout this entire painting, I didn't care. The likeness, even at this, this point, I just didn't care. I was much more focused in the, the feeling involved in creating a painting in this way. It's very hard to put into words. Now there's another rule that I am going to break. Uh, you may not see it in the footage in this part of the painting. It may not really be visible in the footage, but usually what I do is I pick an area and I start to bring it into focus, like uh, window shade so to speak, in certain areas. But here, what I'm doing is I'm going all around the painting, all around the painting with the smaller brushes reacting to the painting, even in the finesse, in the more finesse-like areas. If you notice, now what we're going to do is just clean off the brush with the odorless mineral spirits, combine the indigo blue, with the fast matte titanium white. So indigo blue, fast matte titanium white. See how large the surface is? It's definitely keeping me at an arm's length away from the painting. So more indigo blue. It's actually a really nice background color too. So indigo blue and a little bit of ivory black to bring down the uh, saturation of the uh, indigo blue. Now we're going to put in the uh, background color. Just sharpen the edge around the hair. A little bit more work has been done on the hair now. Just following the fundamentals of light and dark. And now we're putting in the cast shadow. So we're almost at the end now. Use your imagination. So at this point, remember the photo reference is a suggestion. So now with Venetian red and ivory black, a little bit of the uh, walnut alkyd medium has gone into the mix. Venetian red, uh, ivory black, a little bit of the uh, alizarin permanent. I'm now going to place something in the painting that wasn't there originally, or wasn't in the photograph originally. So I'm going to put a, a little um, 
a, a V a V cut shirt with an off earth reddish color, not bright red, but earth red, which is why I'm using the Venetian red primarily for this color. Why did I put this in? Because I felt like it. I felt like it was something, an element of color or shape, just an element that needed to be there, that needed to be in the painting. And usually where there is light, there is shadow. So now with the uh, alizarin permanent, I'm putting in a darker shadow, alizarin permanent and ivory black, uh, some darker accents for this imaginary piece of clothing that we're starting to put in the painting. It just felt like it needed to be there. The edges, of course. We're just going to soften these edges with a clean and dry synthetic brush. And this is pretty much going to be the very last adjustment that I'll be making on this painting. I could have worked on this painting multiple days, just letting it dry and then reworking it. But I decided to let it be. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to watch more videos like this one, please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you would like to support this channel even more and also see the uh, bonus video for today. Head on over to patreon.com. Again, I have that in the description box down below. Remember, find form with freedom. Most of all, remember the photo reference is a suggestion. Always remember to enjoy the process of creating your very own paintings. And it's now time for our new patron shoutouts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deanna Minor. And thank you. Thank you so much, Johannes Kalsbeck. Thank you all so much for your support on my Patreon. It means the world to me. And remember, don't forget to check out the patron-only behind-the-scenes bonus episode for this week's video.